by Club WWI.com members. You may know about wrestling's world's strongest man or your Olympic hero. Well, where I come from, it's only one guy, the original, the man who drives nails with his hands. Uh, you could probably do the same thing to your head, the one and only Mr. Ken Patera. Ken, how are you? Just fine, James, and yourself? I am doing great. I'm so glad that we finally have a chance to have you on. And, and before we get into anything, why don't you let people know how things are in the world of Ken Patera right now? Well, I'm uh, 65 years old now, and I'm, I'm not on Social Security yet because I still work. Nice. Uh, uh, after being in the wrestling uh, game for 20 years, you know, Let's put it this way. I was an amateur athlete uh, before I started wrestling. I was in the 72 Olympic Games in Munich, Germany. And I had my first official match like the middle of December 1972. And uh, when I started, I didn't have a dime. I didn't have two nickels to rub together. And 20 years later... Well, I, I, actually, I, I retired from the WWF in, uh, at Survivor Series uh, uh, 1988, mm -hmm. which was Thanksgiving Day, is uh, in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. But uh, when I retired, I didn't have two nickels to rub together. Oh wow! So after uh, uh, after basically 16 years. I started broke, and I retired broke. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> well, how, how did that decision come about? To um, I mean, I mean, a lot of people when they, when they choose to retire, you know what I mean, by, by not having you know a good amount of money in the bank. But what, what led to your decision to retire at the Survivor Series? Oh, I just had, I have I was uh, you know I I had uh, three or four major injuries, you know, which resulted in surgeries. I eventually had to have my hip replaced and uh, my left shoulder replaced twice. But uh, even, you know, and for, for years I put it off, you know, and uh, it just got to a point that, uh, you know, I had to have the surgeries. That might but, be. Uh, but uh, <laughs> when, when you work for a ruthless son of a bitch like McMahon, he knew that I was down and out. I was going through a divorce. Okay. And he knew he had me by the balls. And uh, so he would put me uh, out on the West Coast, you know, start me off, uh, you know, north of Seattle, uh, Washington. That, 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 that's a true story. Okay. And uh, he was paying me around 2500 a week. Well, back then it cost over 200 a day. Uh, just to be on the road, you know, when you figure out your, your hotel room, your rent a car, and, uh, you know, so on and so forth. <clears throat> and, and then, you know, uh, you have a home and kids. That's another, uh, you know, a uh, couple hundred a day. And when you're making 2500 a week, you know, and then you have to pay your taxes and your accountant and so on and so forth. Well, you're working for nothing. Yeah. Now, this went on for about five, six months. Yeah, five or six months. I just got fed up with it, you know. So I, I talked to him, uh, I think it was in August, uh, about, let's see, September, October. I'm about four months before I retired. Okay. And uh, I told him, I said, Vince, I said, you know, this is a bunch of bullshit, you know. I still consider myself an asset. You've been tr treating me like a liability for the past six, seven months. Well, you know, you know, you had a few injuries and stuff. I said, yeah. I, I, I said, and when I was injured, I dislocated my shoulder in uh, Fort Myers, okay. Florida, flew to Houston the next day. And the pain was so excruciating, I was actually going to work. But I, I got to the point I, 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 I was actually passing out from the pain. So I got on a plane out of Houston, flew back to Minneapolis, and the doctor set my shoulder. But that's how it was, yeah. you know. Uh, and uh, so I, I told him, I said, you know, I, I think I better get out of this game. I'm going through a divorce. I'm not making anything. 
and I, I, I said, it's quite obvious you don't want me uh, around here anymore. Well, God, can you stay until Survivor Series? You know, if, if you work with Big Boss Man, you know, he's a little green. We want to push him if, if you could get him over. And then Bad News Brown, you know, we'd like to get him over. And, and a few other guys, you know. And I said, yeah, sure, I, I don't give a shit. So basically, every night I was just laying down in the middle of the ring, one, two, three, because I, I didn't give a shit. Okay, to take a nap. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, hey, I know where I'm from. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I went to the Olympic Games and uh, won four gold medals in the Pan American Games. You know, I was uh, on the U.S. team as a shot putter, you know, back in uh, college. Yeah, I didn't need this crap, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I wasn't a make-believe uh, um, creation of Vince McMahon or any other promoter. Man, so, you know, just... <laughs> I remember I did some jobs in the middle of the ring for some of these guys. <laughs> like, uh, what, what was the kid's name that uh, walked around like a rooster? Oh, Terry Taylor. Yeah, Terry, I did a job for Terry Taylor in the middle of the ring in Boston Garden. Oh, my God. While he was the rooster? I, I, yeah. Oh, my God. I thought there was going to be a riot. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. The fans are going nuts. And it was an afternoon show. It was about 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I laughed all the way up the ring. I laughed all the way back. <laughs> I said, this is a cartoon, you know. Well, yeah, but, that, yeah. but that's, you know, it, uh, I had had enough. You know, it was just a, a bunch of BS. And I, you know, well, uh, I, it, it was time to go. Yeah, I wasn't going to you know, go down to WCW or... I don't think it was WCW then, was it? Um, I think it was just about to become WCW, like the next yeah, year. Yeah, you know, I, I think so. I, I don't think Ted Turner in 88. Well, well, whatever it was, I could care less. But, you know, it was, you know, I, it, the, 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 I should have retired after 10 years. And uh, yeah, I, I bumped into a guy down in Dallas, Texas, uh, the second year I was wrestling back in, it would have been in 74. About a year and a half after I started, he says, Ken, and this guy had a beautiful gem, and I can't remember uh, his name. It's a little Jewish guy from New York. He says, Ken, the uh, best advice I can give you, you just started, get out after 10 years, because after 10 years, you're, you're, you're going to become an invalid just like me. Okay. He says, you're going to be limping around, your back's going to hurt, everything is going to hurt the rest of your life. And he says, I went 20, I think he wrestled like 20 years or 22 years. You know, this back in the 40s, 50s, 60s. Yeah. And I should have taken his advice. It was, well, I mean, and, that's uh, one of the, I mean, you say, you say now, I mean, you, you transitioned out of the bill. A lot of guys, they're, they're never able to do that. You know what I mean? Even being in the business, I mean, if, I think you were in 16 years then, it must have been, or 15 years. So, 16 years, yeah. But yeah, like Rick Flair still wants to wrestle today. It kind of seems sometimes like, I, mean, I was just talking to uh to Dave Taylor, who did an interview the other day about the fact that just because you can still go doesn't necessarily mean you should, because it just takes that one right. uh, one night. Oh, I could have wrestled another five, mm -hmm. six, seven years. Yeah, but you know, I, I you know, I said, well, you know, what the hell, you know, why? I got Ric Flair in the business. We started the same day. Oh, same day. I didn't know that. Yeah, we had a house together over in South Minneapolis. Oh. That was the original Animal House. <laughs> oh wow! Rick, Rick, Rick was born. To be in professional wrestling, like, yeah, you know, that 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 was his uh, future when he was born. <laughs> I, mean, I can't imagine him as a school teacher or anything. <laughs> I don't think he would no, work out so well. No, no, no. Rick, Rick, Rick found his right profession, and I didn't. You know, I, uh, I'd look back and I, I, I sell uh, heavy equipment replacement parts to the sand and gravel business now, okay. and uh, I love it. Hey, I wish I would have done it, uh, you know, right, right, right out of college. Yeah. But I did what I wanted to do at the time, and that was, you know, go to the Olympics and World Championships and Pan Am Games and all that, you know. And uh, so, you know, I accomplished that. Then I wanted to wrestle, mm -hmm. and so I wrestled. And then, you know, you know, people say, "Do you miss it?" I said, "Are you kidding?" <laughs> <laughs> I said, hell no. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I feel like if 
you watch it today, I feel like everybody misses it because it's nothing even close to, I guess, what it was when you first got into it. No, I've watched maybe a total of 30 or 40 minutes since 2000. Mm -hmm. and this is 2009 and a half. So nine and a half years I've watched it less than an hour. Man. If you had it all up. And, that, that's, yeah. uh, and that, that, that can be kind of a painful hour, I think, <laughs> when you look at the last 10 yeah, years. Yeah, overnight. I, I, I don't think I've watched... Uh, I caught some advertising here a month or two ago. When, when, when was WrestleMania? Um, March. Yeah, Mar back in March I caught a, a little blip on, uh, I think, ESPN advertising or something about... Uh, uh, I, I don't even remember who who was about, but uh, that's how interested I am in uh, as, you know, as a professional wrestling fan. I could care less. Well, I gotta, so, I gotta, when, when you did it, I think you were, I mean, one of, one of the best heels, really, at the time. I remember watching you, uh, even on TNT, I think one of my favorite moments, it was long before Vince McMahon was the owner on TV, he was still just an announcer on TV. And you would, yeah. you would do your test of strength on TNT, and the entire time you would ridicule Vince McMahon. And I used to, I was watching you tell him he wasn't tough enough to do it. You're doing the nails um, yeah. with your hands. How much of that, I mean, how did you go about doing that? Was that gimmicked at all, or was that, I mean, I, I would imagine it wasn't. No, no, you just put a piece of leather in the palm of your hand, and yet you, you have to push the nail yeah. forward. Yeah, and, and then you have to bend it. And then you have to, uh, I, I didn't bend spikes, I bent bolts. Okay. Those uh, high-tempered uh, bolts. All right. Because I knew if anybody else picked them up, they'd never be able to bend them. Thank you. So that, that, that's why I did that. Yeah. They were amazing. <laughs> I mean, uh, stopping the truck with your legs and the, and the whole nine. Yeah, oh, yeah. Just mind-blowing. Yeah, we did all kinds of stupid things. Yeah, McMahon started working for his dad in 76, just a few months uh uh, before I started for his dad. As a matter of fact, uh, Howard uh, Finkel, uh, Vince hired Howard Finkel to do his, uh, to write his advertising. Okay. And uh, I think his dad put him in, put, uh, I always call him Junior or Vinny, I call him Vinny Junior. Okay. But I, I think I was the only one to call him Vinny Junior because everybody else is afraid to because yeah. he hated it. He hated it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, his dad gave him uh, West Haven and uh, some towns up in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, um, he gave him Portland, Maine, or Bangor, Maine. Uh, you know, his dad probably gave him about 10 or 12 uh, locations to promote, you know. And then do the TV announcing, so, man. Okay. Yeah, so we basically started at the same time for his dad. I loved his dad. Oh, yeah, I love his, people have good things to say about Vince Senior. His dad, I never had a bad word to say about his dad, except when I got a bullshit uh, payoff that I'd call him at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and he'd always answer the phone. <laughs> That's yeah. good, though. A lot of guys don't. Now, nowadays, you bounce a check, and a lot of these promoters, they, they change their, main, their name and they move to Costa Rica. Yeah. <laughs> right. I wanted, yeah. To, I wanted to ask you about the uh, the Grand Wizard, because, I mean, he's a, he's a guy that you worked with that I mean, is legendary. Sure. I, I was like working with him. Yeah. Huh? What was it like working with him? Oh, I loved it. Yeah. He's a hell of a uh, uh, manager, you know. Like, Lou Albano was great, too. I, I, I liked working with Lou, but shit, you know, here I'm the world's strongest man able to beat up ten guys at a time without any outside interference, right? Yeah. I take a 150-pound uh, Puerto Rican and take him out of the ring, you know, <laughs> yeah, and, you, you know, horse around the ring in front of the camera and get the crowd all crazy. And Albano would be out there throwing the guy in the ring post. You know, and they're hitting them with a steel chair. You know, why, why, why do you need that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Lou, I don't need your assistance, pal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I, after a while, you know, I, I kind of got fed up with it. Then I talked to uh, McMahon Sr. about getting Ernie as a manager, and so that worked out better, yeah. Oh, uh, that's awesome. Well, I mean, you had, I mean, your career with, with the, 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 I think one of the most famous things that people probably ask you about all the time is about, about Andre the Giant and, and, the, and the work that you guys did with him when, when he had his haircut and you were in the Heenan family. I mean, 
that was right before, uh, right around the explosion of professional wrestling. I mean, what was yeah. it like being a heel, going after one of the top, at a time when the business wasn't as open as it was? How, how was it like just walking down the street after you had uh, uh, savagely beaten Andre the Giant with, with, with fans uh, on the street? Well, back then, you know, if I parked my car outside the rain, I'd come out, I'd have a flat tire, a broken windshield, oh, man. and stuff like that. So uh, the old man got the building managers to let me park inside. Oh, okay. Because back in those days, we drove, you know. Yeah. And um, um, because, well, we had serious heat back then. I, I don't think, I don't know. I, I really watched it. I don't think they have serious heat, you know, where people want to kill you and, and everything. I think it's it's so scripted now that... I think it's a sitcom, you know. R- right. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, it's still great entertainment, I'm sure, you know, but I don't... It's a different emotion, you know, I guess, it gets from fans now. I mean, that, that yeah, well, be- when I was in the business, just the last year or two, they started writing the scripts for the guys. Mm. Well, it took the personality away from uh, each individual. When I started, everybody... You had Mad Dog Vashon, and you had Baron Von Raschke, you had uh, Dick the Bruiser, and, uh, you know, and all the good, you had Bruno Sammartino, and so on and so forth. And the thing is, everybody, nobody had a script. No, no, nobody was told what to say, you know, except you knew who you were going to wrestle, you know who your opponent was going to be. Mm-hmm. And then you winged it, you know, it was all ad lib. And then uh, McMahon, uh, you know, started, uh, brought in a couple script writers, and they started writing, and they, they, you know, 10 minutes before the interview, they'd give you, a, you know, a 10-paragraph uh, uh, script. You know, well, that's what we, you know, uh, memorized it. And, you know, I go, what? Yeah. I, I, yeah. Weird. <laughs> I said, it's a bunch of BS, you know, and I didn't go along with it. Yeah, a couple times I did. Then after that, I said, the hell with it. You know, I just skim read it. And, uh, you know, it makes everybody sound the same, you know, when everybody's reading from the same writer. It, exactly. And now I don't know how many writers they have. Some, but Jimmy Brunzel told me they have like six or seven yeah, they have a ton of writers. Or, yeah, a bunch of them, maybe even more than that now. And they come in and out, too. They, they, there's a big turnaround with people who just, uh, I mean, even for writers, I mean, there's a certain amount when you're working for somebody like, like Vince McMahon, especially, where he knows what he wants, and it's kind of like, right. you know, you work underneath him, and you're supposed to, you know, be kind of like your own person and have your own ideas, but at the end of the day, it, it's really his decision, and, and he just tells you what to do yeah. right now. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Well, he wants to control, well, he can control everything. He owns the place. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, he worked his ass off to... To do what he eventually did, you know, he wanted to put all the other promoters out of business. His dad never wanted to do that. Yeah. And the other promoters didn't want to do that. You know, they had visions of doing it, but they never really got, you know, 100% serious about it, you know. Um, I remember when uh, Vern Gagne teamed up with Jimmy Crocker Promotions out of North Carolina, you know. And they were trying to make a move, but, you know, they... You know, they didn't have the money, and they didn't, you know, I don't know, it's just, yeah, you can't, money. yeah, it has to be run by one person, one person only, you know, like Vince knew that, yeah. because when you get two or three egos involved in trying to uh, establish something, like that Eddie Einhorn, I think he was out of Chicago, and he had the TV, and, well, you know, it just failed, it was a complete, you know, like oh, yeah. Ted Turner. You know, Ted Turner was a wrestling fan when he was a kid. His dad used to take him down to the auditorium on Peachtree Street Street down there in Atlanta, Georgia. And he used to sit down there with Jimmy Carter's mom and brother Billy. And, you know, and I think Turner was, what, 10 years old, 12 years old, whatever it was back then. You know, and so he was always a lifetime wrestling fan. But that didn't mean that he that qualify him to be a wrestling promoter. <laughs> Doesn't work together now. Yeah, he, you know, that, when he got in the wrestling business, I think he was worth seven or eight billion dollars. Yeah, yeah. Now I don't even know. Uh, I, I think by the end of it, it was to the point where I mean they made money for for just a few years, but for the most part, it was a losing venture. Well, yeah, because he, you know, he he ran it like a corporation. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You can't run it. Uh, you can't run it like a corporation. Well, he found out. Yeah. And these guys were. 
it, but uh, Eric Bischoff eventually wound up uh, in control. Eric Bischoff was the cameraman here for Vern Gagne in the old AWA back in the 80s. I was going to say you were there when he was there, right, in the 80s, Eric? I, well, I came back here um, after I retired from the WWF, and I opened up a house club in about, uh, I think it was around May or June of, uh, or no, maybe it was April of uh, 89, okay. uh, I got a call from the AWA office, I can't remember, I think Wahoo McDaniel might have called me, and uh, so I went down there and I talked to them, you know, and they, they were ready to go out of business, you know, yeah, but uh, uh, anyway, I, I told them, I said, well, I, I said, this is just, I don't know if I want to uh, wrestle anymore or not. I got my health club open. I'm doing independence out on the West Coast and back on the East Coast and some in the Midwest and stuff. I said, I don't know, you know. But my heart wasn't in it, you know. So that was actually the, the end of my wrestling career. Well, Although I did, you know. I'm going to ask you right around the time because there's one thing that was, was surprising to me. Without, I mean, obviously you were out at WWF for a few years. I want to you know, go through that whole story again. But one of the things that surprised me was when you came back, the business, as we said before, with the Red Rooster, everything was very cartoon and kind of character-oriented. And WWF, when you came back, kind of used your real life as, as your gimmick, which I always found, especially at the time, kind of weird because it didn't really fit in. How did you feel about that, about using your personal life uh, as part of the story on WWF TV when you came back as a good guy? Oh, that didn't bother me at all. Okay. No, I I could care less. You know, it's it's entertainment. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything's scripted and and whatnot. You know, so I mean, it was uh, like doing a play. You want to you want to go to uh, uh, Broadway and uh, do a stage play. You know, Mm -hmm. same thing. I mean, everything's scripted. Were you surprised at, at how, how well the fans kind of took you in? I mean, because not only with you know, your situation, but on top of it, you, you left as a heel. And now you were as a baby face. And you really, I mean, you came back and you got over uh, as a good guy. Were you surprised with, with how well the fans uh, kind of welcomed you back? Well, there's always, there's two sides to every coin. Okay. Uh, or every scenario, I should say. <clears throat> you have a good guy and you got the bad guy. Yeah, but however you present yourself, you know, no matter how bad you were, people can still like you. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, the best good guys in the business were the worst bad guys. Yep. I mean, you know, and so when, the, yeah, because when fans love to hate you, then they they love to love you too. It's like they're just waiting for you to turn so they could cheer for all the bad things you were doing before. Exactly. Right, yeah. And, uh, like, you know, when, when fans fill up uh, Madison Square Garden, they didn't want to see, uh, when I wrestled Bruno Sammartino, we had, uh, you know, incredible crowds back there. So, you know, I think the second time of wrestling Madison Square Garden back in 77, we, we set an all-time attendance record that was never broke. Oh, wow. And the reason it wasn't broke because the fire marshal limited the amount of people you get into the felt forum down below. Okay. And so we, I think we had 22,096 people in attendance that night. Wow. Well, the people, you know, that they didn't want uh, Bruno to lose. They, <laughs> they, they wanted Ken Patera, uh, or let's say, they didn't care if Bruno won. They just wanted to see Ken Patera get the shit kicked out of him. <laughs> yep. You know? Oh, yeah. And so it's, uh, that, 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 that's how it is, though. You know? You know? So, well, so. well, yeah, they always said that. Yeah, it was always, uh, you know, the best, the best heels because at the end of the day, I mean, you really can, you, you can almost be a lot realer than the baby faces. The guys have to kind of be the heroes and, and kind of be the examples. But with the bad guys, you can kind of relate right. to them because you know more bad guys in real life anyway than <laughs> most people. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> exactly. Most people are pricks. Yep. You know? oh, yeah. Well, let me, let me ask you about your finisher because I think it's, it's probably the best finishing move I remember in wrestling. It's something that they don't even do today, which always surprised me, the spinning full Nelson, which yeah. I thought was awesome. I mean, it took a lot of power to do something like that. What was it like coming up with that move? And 
I mean, do you know any reason why it's not done today anymore? Is it just that no one has really the, kind of the power to do it? Yeah, I don't think anybody's strong enough to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, and I used to do it on those lousy old uh, ring mats we had. They were all loose, and yeah, now they're they're the ring mat. You know, the canvas is pulled nice and tight. Mm -hmm. But back then, you know, uh, you know, I was twisting my ankles and everything else doing them. Wow. <clears throat> Sometimes, you know, I just uh, so. A lot of times when I, whoever I was wrestling, you know, I check out the canvas. If it was loose, I wouldn't do it. Okay. You know, I just slap them in the full Nelson and you know, whatever. But it's I don't know. I guess it's probably a strength factor. Hell, I used to swing guys 350 pounds. I yeah. I, I don't think there's anybody in the business, uh, you know, that uh, could do that. Well, as a matter of fact, I know there isn't. No, because they're all bodybuilders. No, you don't have any weightlifters in there. Yeah, it's different now. No, but that was, I mean, yeah. it was, I mean, I saw, I mean, half the guys you picked, it wasn't just, for anybody listening, when I was just talking about, like, Cruz, I mean, he picked up everybody in, in, into that full Nelson. Yeah. And, and it was, I mean, a visual, you talk about a visual, just watching you spin people around in circles in a full right. Nelson. You don't see too much of that. No, no. Well, you know, I have a discus thrower and hammer thrower. Uh, in college, so I, I, you know, I, I had good balance, and I was able to, you know, I, in order to throw the hammer and discus, you have to be able to spin. Yeah. You know, so when you slap somebody in the full Nelson, what you're doing, you're just duplicating those movements. Yeah. Plus, I was the world's strongest wrestler. I wasn't a make believe like John Studd and Dino Bravo and all the guys McMahon brought in. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you were. You yeah, were the, the world's one. strongest wrestler. <laughs> John Studd and I are tag team partners. So it's, John Studd's now the world's strongest wrestler. <laughs> yeah, how'd that work out? <laughs> yeah, that, 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 McMahon. Yeah, he he did that. You know, not only to me, he did it to everybody. Yeah, yeah kind of. He, 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 well, he, he take your identity away from you. Yeah. You know, he did it deliberately. You know, because he wanted he he didn't create me. But he created all these other cartoon characters, and uh, which is fine because that's what the business is, you know. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, like uh, Rocky Johnson's uh, dad. Um, uh, well, Rocky Johnson. <laughs> yeah. The Rock. The Rock's dad, Rocky. But, you know, the, 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 the Rock. Well, his dad, Rocky Johnson. Him and I were tag team partners down in Georgia, mm -hmm. and. Uh, but it was an entirely different era. You know, I mean, we were all basically, you know, action heroes. Yeah. And, uh, but we created our own um, uh, persona. Well, then when McMahon's dad passed away and Vince got uh, control of it, you know, everybody was his creation, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, yeah. Which is all that way he has control. And then I guess he started, uh, uh, you know, putting everybody under contract and stuff. I was never under contract. No? Never with McMahon. No, ne never signed a contract. No. Wow. I mean, it's kind of different back then. And then you were, uh, I remember, too, you, you were one of the guys when uh, when everything happened with, with Duggan and the Iron Sheik. That you, you, you were brought in as a, as a sub for that, right? The what now? Well, when the Iron Sheik and Hacksaw Jim Duggan were suspended for a brief while, you were one of the guys that they brought in uh, as a substitute, right, for uh, for Duggan in the tag matches, I think I remember, at house shows. They had in, you up. Uh, in the what matches? It was uh, it was Duggan and the Iron Sheik had gotten suspended. I only remember this because they were yeah, going to be there. And, and you, I was there. We were doing uh, TV uh, shooting Buffalo, New York that day. Mm-hmm. Well, I remember at Nassau Coliseum, they were supposed to have a tag match, and I think you were one of the guys that, that substituted for uh, for Duggan, I think. Oh, I might have been. I, yeah. I, I, I don't remember. No, but this is a lot that, I mean, at the time without a contract, that, you know, Vince was having you substitute, because it kind of seems like that would be a position that he would want somebody under contract. I mean, it says a lot about you to not have a contract and still have the company trust you enough to, to kind of do those dates. Yeah, well, I started the business without a contract, and I retired without a contract. <laughs> Man, they never had one at all anywhere? No. Oh, wow. Oh, I had one with Vern Gagne, yeah, but it was so one-sided that the judge threw it out. All right. I took court down in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. it, you know, I was making about 45 bucks a day, and I'm not exaggerating. Oh, my gosh. And uh, that's what everybody was making down there. That It was horrible territory. Well, when I first went down there, anyway, he wanted 10% of 450 bucks.
bucks a week. Well, after I got through paying my expenses and stuff, yeah, <laughs> I didn't have ten ten cents left on ten dollars. Oh man! So I took it, and I was trained at a gym down there, and there was a judge that worked out there. And so I told him about it. He says, Ken, so I, I showed him the contract. And he looked at the contract. He started laughing. He says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm not, he said, I'm not even going to for this. This is so one-sided that it's an invalid contract. You know, he's, he's not giving you any consideration of uh, uh, say-so in this. He said, he's, uh, a contract has to be balanced, you know. Mm-hmm between, you know, the employer and the employee. Well, if it isn't, it's automatically invalid. Well, this was so invalid that, so he, he wrote a letter to Ganya's attorney and then called up there, and that was the end of that. So funny. That's, uh, yeah, so. Typical. <laughs> right, and that's basically, I don't remember what the deal, I, I remember Vince wanting everybody to sign a contract, and I don't think I ever did sign it. Yeah. I, I told him, I said, I looked at it. I said, this is a much better than the contract Bern Gagne gave me back in 73. Mm-hmm. And this would have been around 84 and stuff. Yeah, I don't think I ever did sign it. Wow. Yeah. yeah it was different. Back, I mean, especially back then, I think a lot of, that's one of the things that Bruno San Martino had spoken about. Um, I had asked him about an interview I saw him do where he talked about, they asked him if wrestling was real or fake, and he said that anybody, you know, a lot of wrestlers take bribes to lose, and if you do that too much, you're not going to last long. And I asked him, I said, you know, you're kind of keeping kayfabe, not really exposing the business. And he said it was that way back then because if you went to a territory, all you really had was your, your identity. And if a promoter wanted you to lose to somebody you didn't want to lose, you could just take your bags and leave. So at the yeah. end of the day, it almost, it almost was that, real. I, 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 I did that three, four times. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was different. Oh, yeah. But, uh, at the Omni... Uh down in Atlanta, uh, uh, George Scott was the booker, mm-hmm. and I had been there about three and a half months. Uh, and uh, he wanted me to drop the Georgia title to uh, Tommy Rich. Okay. And uh, Tommy and I, when when we were down, when I came in, the territory was actually uh, it, it was just a total disaster. And we finally built it up. We'd like tripled uh, the grosses, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, so George comes in, wants me to drop the belt, the Georgia Championship belt to Tommy Rich, I, and I told Tommy that this was going to happen. So we're in the locker room, and I, I, I called Tommy in, you know, I said, Tommy, what, what did I tell you about a month ago when George was coming in, that he'd want me to drop the belt, and we don't even have this thing established yet, and here he wants to fuck it up already. And uh, and Tommy says, yeah. And so George Scott says, well, what are you talking about? I said, I told Tommy just before you came in that you're going to screw this whole angle up and have me drop the belt. So Bill Eady had just came in from Japan, and he was in another locker room. I says, well, give the belt to Eady. That's what you're going to do anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just hand it to him. There you go. So I didn't even go to work. I said, here. Wow. I said, Tommy, here's, here's the belt. And so they had a, I, you know, I, I quit. I just walked out. And I, I left. Uh, or no, I was still living in Peachtree City. And uh, I was just south of Atlanta. And then I was doing independence. So I was working for Bill Watts and Sam Mushnick and uh, Frank Tunney and, you know, yeah, guys, guys all over the country. See, they don't have that option nowadays. Now, it's, we were just talking the other day, there's, there's really only two bridges left, and if you burn either one of those, then there's really nowhere to work anymore in the United States. Well, well McMahon, that was his mission. Devour it all. That was his mission statement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take everybody out. Destroy all opposition. Oh, man. And I then, did it deliberately. And then you wonder where, well, then they wonder where there's no more new talent coming in. It's because there's nowhere else for them to get experience before they show up to the door at him. Well, I heard a rumor. <laughs> this is just between you and me. Don't tell anybody. Okay. <laughs> when you write this blog, you can put it in, but say that this is just between you and me. All right. You don't need any talent nowadays. <laughs> I, I, 
don't need any. You put a shiny uniform on of some kind and some fr fringes and grow long hair and paint your face and you're a professional wrestler. Mm -hmm. You know, and jump off the top of a 10-foot ladder and whatever else you want to do and you'll be an instant hit. What's that with that? Music, TV, I feel like a lot of stuff is like that nowadays. Now it's just everything's hype. It's, it's all hype. Yeah. Last question. We ask this of all of our guests. If you could choose someone, maybe someone who was in the business before you, maybe somebody uh, you just weren't in the same place with at the same time, that you say, I wish I could have worked with this person when I was wrestling. Uh, who would you pick? Oh, well, I'd say Lou Says. But I did wrestle Lou Says when he was 58 years old at the Sam Houston Coliseum in Houston, Texas. Oh, wow. We went two out of three. Okay. Uh, yeah, Lou, 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 Lou was a hell of a guy. He passed away right now. But he wrestled until I think I think one of his last matches in his, his 80s or 70s. I think it was in his 70s. He wrestled. I mean, he wrestled everybody. There's so many people that come on the show that I, I would never expect to have worked with him, and so many people got a chance to wrestle him. Oh, he's a great guy. Yeah. They oh, I love him. Oh, hey, Lou was a person. Yeah, he was all caught up in all this. Yeah, Lou Lo started wrestling back in the th early 30s. I always heard about his hands, that he had hands almost like a, like a bear, that they were so big. I, I don't remember. Okay. But of course, I have big hands, too. <laughs> so relative so, like, to me. I cancel each other out there. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, the guys, I, I, I mean... Back in the 50s, I grew up watching wrestling in Portland, Oregon, and, you know, I wanted to be a professional wrestler. And just, just like every generation, every 10 years or whatever, kids sit in front of the TV and they want to be a professional wrestler. It's, just, it's the same now. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I don't begrudge the, the, the people actually performing in the ring, you know. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's a good opportunity for him. It's a good living now. But when I wrestled, it was actually a struggle. And uh, I, I, I was the main event in Corpus Christi, Texas, wrestling Jack Briscoe for the world title. Yeah. I made $25, and he made $35. Oh, wow. So <laughs> he was NWA champion. Man. Yeah, there was like 150 people in the place. <laughs> Different time. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I tell people that the honest to God truth, wow. and uh, it. Uh, yeah, but I there was a lot of situations like that, you know, and uh, just, but that was you know that was back in the the mid seventies, and that's just how things were. Absolutely. And you know, some territories would be booming for four or five years, and they go dormant for four or five years, and they boom again. But the, everything went in cycles, and things still go in cycles. Like I say, you know, there's a seven-year uh, cycle of everything, mm -hmm. and it just seems like uh, that. That's how it uh, how it is. The stock market uh, will recycle itself every seven, eight years. Vince McMahon, after his dad passed away in '84. That's recycled three or four times since then, and that's uh, what sixteen, almost twenty-six years now. It's well, well, it's recycled three times, four times already. Absolutely. Now he's had his ups and downs, you know, and but that's how how life is, and that's how business is. And I don't care what business you're in, you know, just uh, you have your booms and your busts. So the 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 kids wrestling now, well. A lot of them are kids, you know, they're grown men, you know, they're 30, 40 years old. But, yeah, they're making a good living. You know, I, I just, in the end, I didn't like, uh, the reason I really fell out of flavor with it is the fact that the travel. Mm -hmm. I had two young daughters, and they had us on the road constantly. I mean, I was home like three, four days a month. It was bad back then. Right. And I, I don't know what it is now. I, I haven't talked to anybody. I, I could care less. But when when you have little kids at home and your wife wants a divorce because you're never home, and like I was, I think, what was I, 44 or 45 when I finally retired from the WWF? I, I mean, you know, it was uh, a breath of fresh air.
And I always wanted to have a house pump, and I never had the opportunity when I was on the road every day. So I opened up a health club. I had it for nine years. The first seven years was fantastic. The last ten, the last two years was a disaster. <laughs> like I say, everything goes in seven years. Right? <laughs> exactly. The, the company I work for now, we're the, the largest of its kind in the country. Uh, we make specialty products for the uh, agri business. And I've been there, uh, it'll be eight years in November. Wow. I, I started eight years ago on my uh, birthday. And uh, we had a sales meeting yesterday, and I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm sitting there, and the CEO comes in. He lives out in Phoenix. And he comes in. I say, hey, Tom, how you doing? He's good, Jim. What, what's up? I says, you know, November, I'll be here eight years. He says, yeah, good. He says, we're glad that uh, you came on board. I said, well, you know what the, the life cycle is. <laughs> what, what do you mean? And I told him what I just told you. <laughs> yeah, no, that. He says, well, you're not thinking of quitting. I said, no. Because when, when I started, I told him I, I'll work till I'm 75, and they were elated. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, it's, yeah. So that's going to be good. I mean, one of the things you say about being able after wrestling to kind of settle in, it, it's, I talk to a lot of people who do kind of the same thing that you did, got out of the business and kind of take on, uh, you know, most people will consider just, you know, the, the regular everyday life, and they love it. They can love it. It's almost like being in that wrestling world makes you appreciate normal life even more when you get to it. Yeah. Oh, it does because wrestling, like uh, country western singers or rock and roll, but uh, any you know comedians, you know people that have to travel constantly. Mm -hmm. It's not natural. Yeah. You know you're in a different city every night, different hotel room, uh, different people. Uh, you know, and, and chances are, you know, people that you vaguely know, they're, they're really not friends or acquaintances. You know, so it's nobody you can really confide in. You know, and. It's just, it's not natural. Yeah, I agree. But, uh, you know, but that's how, that's life. But I, you know, I don't regret doing it. I, I mean, I, you know, uh, I, I appreciate the, that I had the skills and opportunity to be a professional wrestler. Absolutely. But I, you know, I'm not, uh, uh, yeah, angry yeah, or I'm dead or, disappointed or anything like that because I went on with my life. Like I said, I'm 65 years old and I, I'm having more fun now than I ever did. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, and uh, you know, my oldest daughter just bought a house over in uh, uh, Maplewood, Minnesota. You know, not you know, 20 minutes from where I live, you know. And it was about three weeks ago and we were remodeling it and stuff. So, but no, I'm, I'm glad I had the opportunity to be a professional wrestler. And, you know, I look back, you know, I, most of the times were good times, mm -hmm. especially the first 10 years. The last six years were kind of somewhat of a disappointment. Yeah. But that's why I say I should have retired after 10 years. I should have taken the advice from the guy I met in Dallas, Texas, you know, a year and a half after I started. <laughs> I wish I could remember his name. He's really a nice guy. Uh I think he started NetJets. NetJets? Yeah, because he started, uh, he was leasing, uh, 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 Lear Jets back then. Okay. And, uh, then leasing them to, uh, corporations and stuff, you know. And I, I remember him and his wife built a house, uh, out there, and I think it's Richardson, uh, Texas, just north of Dallas, it's a big, richy uh, suburb, and he took me over to his house while it was being built. Well, it wasn't a house, it was a mansion. Okay. He had these marble fireplaces flown in from Italy. I don't know how many. Wow. There had to be 10 or 12 of them. Th this place was a mansion. <laughs> Man. So I got to get into that business. <laughs> yeah, and he, and he wrestled for 20, 22 years. He was fortunate enough to marry a, a lady with a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was worth over $20 million back mm -hmm. then, you know, over 30 years ago. So, wow. Yeah, so he, he hit the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's he hit the lottery one. 
Yeah, he hit the lottery when money was still money. <laughs> he, he used a ring instead of a ticket for that one, I guess. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> well, Ken, yeah. one of the best parts about uh, being a professional wrestling, you have fans that even to this day, uh, through the magic of DVDs and 24-7, people who even came after you are, are still following you today. So last thing, we give oh, all yeah. of our guests a chance to speak directly to their fans. So what do you have to say to all the Ken Patera fans out there? Well, I thank them for their... Their uh, their patronage, I guess you know their their uh, love of the game, and I appreciate the fact that they thought I was worthy enough to uh, to buy a ticket and see in real life, or buy a DVD and and watch now and appreciate what I was able to do, and. Uh, and like, like I say, I always liked the fans, even when I was a bad guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but most of them didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> you hit it well. <laughs> because without them, none of us would have been able to make a living. Absolutely. And uh, without the fans, uh, nothing would exist. Yeah, you know, the, the, the fans make it possible to uh, to do what you do. Absolutely. And uh, so all you wrestling fans out there that, Watch Campatera back when and still buy DVDs with Campatera on them. Thank you very much. Awesome. Ken, thank you so much, man, for taking the time to talk to us today. It's been great talking to you. Okay, James. Take care.